Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe. This is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. God's not going to lie to you. God never has lied to you. He will never lie to you. We have been talking about how Jesus is the Word of God. If you'll remember, Genesis 1-1 says, In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God, God's technically created, because Elohim is plural for God. So in the beginning, God's created the heavens and the earth. Barashit, bara, Elohim, et Hashemim. In the beginning, God's created the heavens and the earth. Well, if you look at John 1 1, you'll see that John said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what's interesting is in the Greek, there are two words for the word, word. One word that is tr in the Greek that is translated word in English is logos, which means written word, the written word of God. Another word in the Greek that is translated word is rhema, which means the revelatory, the spoken word of God. So anytime you're reading along in your English Bible and it says Word, it uses the word word, W-O-R-D. In the original Greek, it is either logos or it is rhema. But when you're reading it in English, you don't have any way of knowing which one it is. So many times we need to understand what the original word is so we can get a clear understanding of what it is we're reading. For example, in Romans 10, 17, it says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now the word, word, in Romans 10, 17, in the Greek is rhema. So actually it says this, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the rhema of God. Now rhema means living word, spoken word, word that comes alive inside of you. So faith comes when the Word of God comes alive inside of you. Not just reading the Word, not just the Logos, not just the written Word. The Word has got to come alive inside of you in order for there to be faith. But back to John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you read down to verse 14, you find where it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among men, so it's definitely 100%, not a theologian in the world will disagree with you. It is talking about Jesus. Jesus was the Word that John was referring to in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. But what's interesting here is it says logos. In the beginning was the logos. Now, I always thought, I had never looked it up, I just always thought that it must be in the beginning was the rhema, because Jesus is the spoken word of God, Jesus spoke the word of God, and Jesus is the living word of God. But in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the logos, the written word of God. Now, let's step back for just a moment and ask ourselves this question. What is it that John was referring to? Now, John, when he said Jesus was the written Word of God, was not referring to the book of Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, 1st and 2nd Peter. He wasn't referring to any of those. Ephesians, Revelation, why wasn't he referring to any of those? because they hadn't been written yet. They didn't exist yet. They existed in the heart of God because they were inspired by God, but they hadn't been written down yet. So when John said, in the beginning was the Word, referring to the written Word, he's referring to what the Jews called the written Word. In other words, the Torah, the prophets, the law, 
what, what the, the Greeks and, and some Christians call the Pentateuch, which Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All right. So John said, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word, the written Word, was with God. And the written Word was God. And the written Word came to earth and dwelt among men as flesh. And the written Word of God is Jesus. Now in Revelation it tells us that there will be a time when Jesus will rule and reign and he will be given a name again by God that will be for all eternity and the name that he will have. His name is the Word of God. So we find that Jesus, who we call Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus, Actually, his real name is the Word of God. So when, when we talk about the Word, we're talking about more than just the name, like Bob or Larry or Rob or Bill or Susan. We're talking, when we say the name of Jesus, when we refer to Jesus, we're talking about everything that God said that was written down. All the promises, all the plans, all the covenant, everything. Now, with that in mind, let's take a look at a scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. And Paul is writing here, he's talking. Now, I don't know if you've ever read much about what Paul wrote, but he's one of those guys that has like run-on sentences. Have you ever heard the phrase run-on sentence? Have you ever talked to somebody that their life was just one big run-on sentence? Have you ever talked to somebody that once they started a sentence, there was no stopping it? it was, their conversation was like a runaway locomotive. They, they would get near the end of a sentence and you'd start going, ah, 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 and then they would just put the word and, and they would keep on going, and they'd get near the end and, you'd, and they'd go, because, and, well, this is kind of the way Paul writes. And because of that, sometimes it seems a little hard to understand. But we're going to clear up a few things this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. He says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed on how he builds, take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now we could say there, there can be no other foundation laid than the one that was built and that foundation is the Word of God. That foundation is the Word of God. Now, grace is built upon the Word of God. And Paul built according to grace. The implication is to build with the same substance that Paul built with, grace. Now, we all understand faith and how faith is vitally important. Faith is the belief in God and believing what God says is true, and believing it so much that you act on it. Faith is vitally important. We know that Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. In other words, if you're not in faith, you are not pleasing to God. We call ourselves a faith church. Some people make fun of us because we call ourselves the faith people. But you know what? I am pleased to be a word of faith minister because it takes faith to please God. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith, you can't please God. The scripture tells us in Ephesians 2, 8, that we are saved by grace through faith. The scripture tells us that when Jesus 
was approached by the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years. When she touched the hem of his garment, Jesus turned and he looked at her and he says, Woman, your faith has made you well. Not her tithing, not her church attendance, not her good works. And we all need to tithe and we all need to have ourselves gathered together and we all need to do good works. But it was her faith that healed her. Faith is vitally important. In Romans, it says that anything that's not of faith is sin. Anything that's not of faith is sin. And in the book of 1 John, it tells us that this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. If you want to overcome the world, if you want to defeat the things that are coming against you in life, you must have faith. So faith is vitally important, but we also need to not overlook the tandem partner in faith, and that's grace. Grace is the power of God that's activated by your faith. Once again, Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you're saved. How are you saved? By grace. For by grace, the power of God is what saves you, not your power. Nothing you can do. You can clean yourself up, spiff yourself up, do all the things that you think you should do, but nothing you can do can save you. It's the power of God, not your power, the power of God. So by grace, God's power, you are saved through faith. So it's God's power and us believing in God's power. Grace is vitally important. Grace is God's ability, God's strength that he imparts to and empowers you with so that you can do what it is he wants you to do that you couldn't do without him. What is it you need to do in your life? Do you have something that you need in your life, you need to get done, you need to accomplish, you need to overcome? Let me tell you something, sweetheart. You're never going to do it under your own power and be successful. And even if it appears that you're successful, you'll only be successful for a while. The only way to completely overpower the enemy, the only way to completely concede, succeed is with God's power. And God has his power called grace, and he's wanting to give it to you so that you can do what it is you normally couldn't do. Do you think that under your own power you could accomplish anything? Well, you know, there are some things we can accomplish under our own power because God has given us talents and abilities. Some people have talents and abilities to do certain things. But the reality is whatever you can accomplish under your own power pales by comparison to what you could do if you allow God's grace to empower you. God will take you farther than what you can see. God will empower you to do more than what you ever thought was possible. Is, is it too late? No, it's not too late. Time is irrelevant in God's kingdom. The implication is to build on the same substance that Paul built with, grace. And we understand faith, and faith changes things. But the Bible says, the just shall live by faith, but faith is the catalyst that activi activates the grace. We need the grace of God working in our lives. Andrew Murray called grace the power to do God's will. Some people say, well, I just, I know God is telling me to do this. I know that this is what the word says to do, but I just can't do it. Well, first of all, that statement shows that faith needs to be built. But, but secondly, that statement's not true. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. With God, nothing is impossible. Jesus said to him that believes, all things are possible to him that believes. Something coming against you, let me tell you what the word says. No weapon formed against you will prosper. No weapon. And that's for you, young lady. No weapon formed against you will prosper. The power of the living God is available to you and in you so that you can do what looks impossible. There may be obstacles in your life. There may be things coming against you. But it doesn't matter who, what, where, or when. God is the God of the who, what, where, and when. And he can 
maneuver, he can shuffle and change, alter and command circumstances so that they have no foothold in your life. The power of God is stronger than anything that can come against you. The Word of God whispered in your closet is stronger than a thousand trumpets of the enemy. While we are reaching out in faith, there is a substance that we need on the inside to sustain us while we're waiting for the things to come to pass come to pass. That substance is grace. Too often people don't rely on the power of God. Too often people rely on the latest manual for success or the latest Christian buzzword or the latest ministry concept. But grace is what we need. Grace, the power of God, empowering us to do the impossible. The inward power that God puts in you so that you can do what you normally couldn't do. You know, God doesn't care what you can do. People say things like, well, I, I just don't know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you something. Big woo. Big woo. God doesn't care if you can do it or not. Because when God empowers you, you can. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. God will give you his grace. He will empower you so that you can do what you normally can't do. And you come out victorious on the other side. When God finally got through to me and told me that he wanted me to start a church here after I had fought it for a long time, I said, God, I know that you have the ability to forget. And obviously, you forgot the last time I was pastor of a church. You've obviously forgotten all about Fortuna Baptist Church. I mean, I was, I was too busy getting an education in those days and kind of like circling the planets too. I was, I was a Swedish Jimi Hendrix. Loretta, <laughs> Loretta was Jackie Onassis and I was the white boy with big hair and big feet and tie-dye and hung out and played preacher. Loretta told me one time, well, actually, I had this lady that went to our church in Fortuna, and she met me at the back door as I would greet people, and she, she'd say, just keep it up one of these days. You, you could, maybe, might make a good preacher. It was great encouragement, great encouragement coming up on. I just felt... And it really helped, it really helped all the more when Loretta told me that one Sunday, she said, she said, you know that sermon you had today? I said, yeah, she said, you know what, if you preach like that next week, I'm going to put a paper ba grocery bag over my head. I just felt the love coming in. All this encouragement. Well, those days were not really what I would call real good days preaching for me. I stayed up all night to get a 10-minute sermon and talked slow, read the scripture slow, and still only got eight minutes. And it, I mean, it, it's bad. When you don't have much on the inside, it's, it's hard. I, 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 I empathize in some ways with some of these ministers that come on television and they just ramble on for hours saying nothing. The only, sometimes I feel like the only way they could say less would be to talk longer. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> and... Uh, but some, you know, if you don't have anything on the inside, how can you put anything out on the outside? Well, God has something to put on the inside of you. It's called grace. Of course, if you're a born-again believer and His Spirit lives inside of you, He will empower you. All you have to do is believe that that power is available. See, that's how you got saved. For by grace you've been saved through faith. God's power was there to save you all of your life. But that power wasn't activated until you believed in it. Are you following me? When Jesus died on the cross, who did he die for? He died for you, me, him, her, 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 him. He died for all of us. He died for everyone. Now, look, this may rattle some, some cages here, but he died for Adolf Hitler. He died for Osama and his mama. He died for Saddam Hussein and even your sister-in-law. I'm telling you, 
He, he died. He died for everybody. But the only people that get saved are the people who receive it by faith. If you don't receive salvation, if you don't receive that, then that grace for you to get saved is never activated. And it's that way with everything. Well, let me tell you something. You may have had enough faith to get saved. You believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You believe he died for your sins. You believe God raised him from the dead. You applied your faith to salvation and you got saved. But let me tell you something. You can apply your faith to a lot of other things. You can apply your faith to your healing. You can apply your faith to your finances. You can apply your faith to your relationships. You, you can apply your faith to your face. You can apply your faith to your body. Are, are you following me? Faith is vitally important because faith activates the grace that God has given us. Well, I finally had to believe and turn off my old thinking, and I finally had to decide, okay, I'm going to believe that what God told me to do was right, and I'm going to do it. And so here we are. The Bible study turned into a church. But you know what? If we don't believe that what God has is good, that many t then many times we'll try to second-guess God, and we'll try to evaluate what God is saying. When God tells you to do something, or when God tells you you can do something, that is no time to try to negotiate with God and say, well, God, isn't there a better way? Like, hello, do you think God missed something? God has already got it all figured out, way beyond anything you can figure out. So if God tells you to do something, it's the best way. If God tells you to go someplace, it's the best place. If God tells you you are somebody, well, that's the somebody you are. Put faith with it. Be all that you can be in God's army. Turn with me to Romans 5. I'm going to read to you a passage. And as Reverend Sagash says, put your eyes on it because it'll help. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man, who is the one man there? It's Adam. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned, for under the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. In other words, even the people who didn't sin in the Garden of Eden, even the people who didn't sin in the Garden of Eden were sinners because of Adam. Which, by the way, how many people do we have over 50 in here today? All right. Do you remember the song, In Agata De Vida? Okay, can anyone stand up and sing it for us? All right, but you remember the, the lyrics went, In a God of David, you remember that song back? It was a psychedelic song. And it was one of those songs, that, I think it was the first song that ever went over 10 minutes that they played on the radio. You know, it was like 14 or 15 minutes. Did you know that the name, In a God of David, was not the name of that song when they recorded it? But what happened was, is the lead singer was so out of it because of the, the drug stuff that was going on, that what they did is they changed the name of the song to match what he said. And what did he say when he sang the song? In a God of David, baby. That's what he said. So they named the song In a God of David. You know what the name of the song was? The name of the song was In the Garden of Eden, baby. In the Garden of Eden, baby. Who cares? At any rate, I... <laughs> I just thought I'd bring that little bit of life. Okay, when Adam was in the Garden of Eden, <laughs> when Adam was in Agata Davida, <laughs> when, when Adam was in the Garden of Eden, 
Adam sinned. But because Adam sinned, even though you weren't in the Garden of Eden, sin was still brought into the world and, and mankind had a sin nature. All right? And it says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him, Jesus, who was to come. But the free gift, okay, now the free gift there is referring to the gift of grace that Jesus brought. God's power is free. This grace we've been talking about, this grace is a free gift. You can't get it by works. It's not a payment for what you do. Now listen, but the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, the word of God, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. Now, we're going to stop here for just a moment, and I want to quickly tell you this. Sin brings condemnation. God never intended for there to be condemnation in your life. God does not condemn the Holy Spirit convicts. There's a huge difference between condemnation and conviction. Now, we all know the scripture, John 3, 16, that says, For God so loved the world that he gave, he sent, his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. But John 3, 17, the very next verse, continues on. Jesus is talking here. In your Bible, that's red letter. Jesus is talking. And then Jesus goes on to say, for or because God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Now, now let me tell you something about condemnation. When you feel condemned about something, it will push you down, make you feel bad, make you feel unworthy, and drive you toward destruction and even suicide. A person who feels condemned feels like they are worthless, like there is no way out. What I have done can't be reconciled. There's no way I can repent of this. I'm too far gone. It's, there's just too little power and it's too late and I'm done. That's what condemnation does. God, on the other hand, by his Holy Spirit, doesn't condemn us. He convicts us. He convicts us. You're sitting in a service. You're talking with someone. One. You're reading the Word of God, and the power of God comes upon you, and you get convicted. It may be the exact same sin that somebody that the devil tries to con condemn you of. You can commit a sin, and the devil can t bring that sin in your face in such a way that you feel condemned. But God can bring that sin and reveal it to you and convict you of it, show you that that sin can be taken as far away as the east is from the west. He can show you that he's not done with you. He's got a power that can deliver you. And if you'll just repent, you can set on the mountain and you can shout the glory of God and you can be free. That's the difference between conviction and condemnation. It's the same sin. It's the same sin but the devil condemns, God convicts. The devil pushes down, God brings up. And it's the grace of God, it's the power of God. It's the power of God that lifts you up. You can't lift yourself up by yourself. Without the grace of God, without the power of God, there's nothing left but condemnation. But one man sinned and brought sin and condemnation into the world. And this scripture tells us that another man came and Jesus came as the son of man and he brought the free gift, the power of God with him so that we are no longer condemned. But if we'll add belief with it, if we'll add faith with it, we're convicted and we pull out of our sin nature. Now look what it says here. 
Verse 16, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. God deals with justification. He wants you justified. What does justified mean? It's kind of like a theological word, justified. Justified is the condition that God puts you in, and when you're in that justified position, then here's what you can say. I am justified, never sinned. I am living just if I had never sinned. Justified, never sinned. When God justifies you, you are in the place that you would have been had you not sinned. Isn't that good? God eliminates sin. Now, verse 17 For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive. Now, now let me point out something to you here. It's been talking about Adam and Jesus. By the first Adam, sin was brought into the world. By the second Adam, sin was taken out of the world. By the first Adam, condemnation came into the world. Through the second Adam, conviction by the Holy Spirit was brought into the world. You see the difference? But here, it starts out in verse 17, and it talks about by the first Adam's offense, death reigned through the one. Then it it doesn't say the second Adam there. It says, much more those who receive. That's talking about us. Now, what does it say about us? Much more those who receive, in other words, those who receive the second Adam, those who receive Jesus, those who receive the grace of God through faith, much more those who receive abundance of grace of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ, the word of God. We must reign in life. It's time for us as born again believers to start activating the grace, the abundant power of God, so that we are no longer beat down, so that we are walking on high, so that we are living above our circumstances, so that we're walking in the abundance of the grace, the abundance of prosperity. You know how we should fly all the time, not just on one trip. It should, our life should be so that we're always in the positive, you can't outgive God. You can't, if God tells you to go someplace, look, I believe we were told to go to Washington, D.C. And you know what? We got paid to go to Washington, D.C. You buy a thousand dollars worth of tickets and then they give it back to you. Somebody may say, well, that's, that's just kind of like a fluke deal. Well, you know what? We need to quit thinking of that as a fluke deal. We need to start thinking of that as a way of life. God's abundance always is more than, abundantly more than what he tells you to do. If he tells you to do something, if he tells you to go into battle, he doesn't, if you're a soldier of the Lord and he tells you to go into battle, you should not have to go out and buy your own sword, buy your own uniform, buy your own pens that you put on on your uniform to designate if you're a sergeant or a corporal or a general or whatever. I mean, that's about as silly as you join in the, the United States Army and then you say, okay, now go, you're in the tank corps, so now go down and buy a tank. You know, and we want you to show up next week with your tank. Oh, you're in the Air Force. You're going to be flying F-16s, so start saving up those money. You know, start saving up those coupons and get that money together because you're going to be flying an F-16. Of course, you've got to show up with one. No, that's silly. Well, you know, in God's army, it's the same way. We, we are in the army of God. And I'm not just talking about preachers. I'm talking about all of us. We are in the army of God. The Scripture says God has more supply than what you have need. The Scripture says whatever it is you have need of, well, he has more than that. If you need seven on a scale of 10, well, he's got eight for you. If you need three on a scale of 10, well, he's got four. He will always supply in abundance. He's the God of more than enough. 
I love what Keith Moore said when he was here at our church. He said, God pours into a cup, and the scripture says, his cup runneth over. He says, don't you think God knows when the cup's full? You know, is, is God like the waitress that waited on us the other day? He just, you know, just kind of like pouring into the cup and looking off someplace, and he made a mistake, and it just overflowed by accident. You think that's the way God is? Do you think God, let me ask you, do you think God doesn't know when the cup's full? Then is God wasteful? Is God a wasteful God? No. Then there's nothing wrong with abundance and overflow. Because God is the God of more than enough. He's not the God of just enough. He's the God of the land that overflows with milk and honey. His cup runs over and he keeps on pouring, you know. And don't be an idiot and say, stop, stop, stop. Don't do that. You know, the scripture says God takes pleasure in the prosperity of the saints. And my word to God this morning from us is, make yourself happy. You know, <laughs> you know? because if, the, if that makes you happy, let's just tell, let me tell you right now, it makes me real happy too. Because Paul said he knew how to be abased and he knew how to abound. And we know how to abound and we know how to abase. We've lived, we have lived in houses where the window was cellophane that I staped on with a staple gun. We've lived, we've lived in houses where the linoleum had worn so thin that when you swept the floor, you never could finish sweeping the floor. It was like sweeping a dirt floor. You just, you could sweep and sweep and sweep and there's still stuff there. We've lived in those places. We have lived our life with a car in the yard up on blocks because the $2 tires I bought at the gas station wouldn't hold air. We've lived our life, we've had people at our house and looked in the couch after they left, found nine cents and walked a mile and a half to a grocery store and bought a can of Ballard biscuits for nine cents so that we could eat. Are things going good for us now? Yes. But was it dropped in our lap? No. Let me tell you something. We live the life that faith built. God intends for us to live above, beyond, over, more than enough, overflowing, and he has the grace, the empowering to do it. God's arm is not too short. God can stretch out and touch, he can reach out and touch your enemy. You don't have to fight your battles. You don't have to be beat down. And whether your battle is physical, financial, or emotional, whatever it is, we live in the kingdom where the king is the God of more than enough. And he takes pleasure in us tapping in to his resources. God, you'll never... See, we, our God is El Shaddai, not El Chipo. He's the God of more than enough. He's not the God of lack. In fact, he wants us to attack the lack. He wants us to live a good life. God wants you to be happy. He's not like Allah. Allah is a false God. You know what Allah wants for the children of those who worship him? He wants them to strap explosives to their body and walk into schools and restaurants and blow themselves away. And he wants the parents of the child to be happy about it. And many of them are. I saw a I'll close with this, and this is maybe not real good to close on, but <laughs> I'm done, so I guess I'll close with it. The, uh, when we were in Israel last year, um, Menachem and Tova, the people who have the, the hotel on the West Bank, we stayed there for a few days, and uh, they showed us a picture of, a, of the upper torso 
of the young Palestinian man who walked into their hotel, their spiral staircase right there in the, in the front of their hotel. He, he, he walked a few steps up the spiral staircase. He turned and looked at Tova, and he smiled, and he says, Allah is great, and he pulled the ripcord and blew himself completely away. And I don't mean to be gross, but looking at the picture of him, all that's left was from here up, no arms, no legs, not just from here up. And uh, she warned us, and Billy warned us, you know, if, if you have a queasy stomach, don't look at this. But what was interesting is, looking at that picture, is the expression on his face as he died was a smile. Because he had been so deceived as to believe that his God was going to give him 72 black-eyed virgins in a heartbeat if all he would do would be kill a few infidels on his way out. Sometimes we hear the, the news so much that we get jaded to what the enemy is like. But let me tell you something. Jehovah God is not like the enemy. When the Bible talks about the enemy that comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, when Jesus talks about that in John 10.10, 10, the enemy does just that. He comes to steal, to kill, destroy, and let's add this one, and he does it through deception. Well, let me give you the truth. Jesus is the Word of God. When you believe in Jesus, you are believing in the Word, and the Word contains all the promises and all the promises are good. Would you stand? The closing scripture I want to give you today is James 1.17. It says, Every good and every perfect gift. What's good? Abundance is good. Health is good. Happiness is good. Life, joy, peace, gentleness, it's all good. It says, every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, by that no variation or shadow of turning, that means God is good. He's good all the time. It doesn't, it doesn't matter where the sun moves around, his shadow never changes. In other words, he, he casts the same shadow all the time. You're not going to find his shadow one way one day and another way another day. God is always good. And that's the God that we serve. And his grace is available to do good work in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise your holy name. We love you. We magnify you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the power of grace imparted to us so that we can do your will. We thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, there's only one way to access that grace, and that's by faith. And there's only one way that it can be accessed and activated in your life so that your life is a good life, and that's if you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So we're going to make that confession right now. Dear Heavenly Father, I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I believe He died for my sins. I believe you raised him from the dead. I will never deny that Jesus is my Lord. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of them. Thank you for saving me. In the name of Jesus, amen.